arriving about lunchtime in Funchal are a little bit less scary than arriving by plane. We're sharing the harbour with several cruise ships. Le Diamant, which is a rust bucket. Hebridean Princess, which is very smart. Sea Dream 1, which is probably even smarter. And then there's us and Ocean Village. Ocean Village, of course, was the previous Arcadia. A short walk into the park that overlooks the harbour, and here is Christopher Columbus, who wasn't Portuguese, but did spend some time here. And that's the Chapel of Santa Catarina, an old building pressed into new use. Fun Charles taxi drivers saving fuel as they move up the queue. Fun Charles Cathedral peeping out there, but it was closed for restoration, so we couldn't go in. Fun Charles Town Hall and the Collegiate Church. This is also under heavy restoration, but you could see at least some of the magnificent interior. And some of the restorers hard at work. That's the Museum of Religious Art, making up the third side of this square. In the old town, most of the buildings have yet to be modernised and extended, so it still looks much the way it did many years ago. Lots of ethnic restaurants here, apparently. And the terminus of the cable car that goes up to Monte is here. We'd done the cable car trip on a previous visit, so we decided not to repeat it today. The statue is Hal Gonsalves Zarco, who discovered Madeira. Next morning, we're picked up by taxi driver Ricardo da Costa for our pre-arranged day-long island tour. And we start with this viewpoint high above Funchal. Ocean Village left last night, and this morning one of the Costa ships has come in. Madeira is a very mountainous island with lots of deep valleys and until relatively recently was quite difficult to get around but new roads have been built now linking up the remote villages the remotest village is Coral das Freires the nuns valley which was established by a group of nuns who were fleeing from attacks by pirates when they lived near the coast. Only in very recent years has the proper main road system been extended through tunnels to reach this village. Back down on the coast, the traditional fishing village of Camara de Lobos which was one of the favourite places that Sir Winston Churchill came to paint. It's still very much a working fishing village and boasts this tiny fisherman's church. Fun 
further west along the coast, steep cliffs rising straight from the sea. But there's agriculture going on down there at the foot of the cliff and there's only one way to get the produce in and out and that's with a private cable car. We're standing now on top of the second highest cliff in the world and claimed to be the highest in Europe, but whether Madeira is geographically part of Europe or not, I wouldn't be so sure. We stopped for lunch in Rivera Brava a small town which is being smartened up and developed for the tourist trade. We're travelling through the centre of the island now, on the only main road that travels from the south coast to the north. And there you can just see the north coast of Madeira. Mount Teide, at the centre of the National Park, at 3,715 metres, this extinct volcano is the tallest mountain in Spain, and as you can see, we're above the clouds. The clear skies make this mountainside ideal for the location of an observatory, and these telescopes belong to many different nations. The coach tour takes us through this weird moonscape to a public viewing area, the other side of the peak. It is possible to go up a cable car part way up the mountain and then walk the rest of the way, but this isn't advised for people who aren't used to that kind of thing. Our next stop is the small town of Oratava and from the high part of the town you have a view of the coast and the city of Puerto de la Cruz. Our guide then led us on a walking tour down through the town but being strung out like this along narrow pavements we didn't manage to get very much information from the guide. Our stopping point was the House of the Balconies, dating from 1630 and built in the traditional Canary Island style. More balconies inside. It's also a craft centre and provided the commercial opportunity of the trip. And look, real canaries in the Canary Islands.
finally down to Puerto de la Cruz on the coast, the original capital of Tenerife and today the main tourist venue on the island. Las Palmas is the capital of Gran Canaria, a busy modern port, but we've opted to go on a coach tour of some of the main resorts around the coast. This is Playa del Inglés, the English beach, near Massa Plumas. Apparently, when tourists first started coming to Gran Canaria, Inglés, English, was the name commonly used for all of them. Puerto Rico was once a simple fishing village. Now, seemingly every square millimetre of the steep hillside of this valley has been built on. And in fact, the valley next door has been taken over as well. Puerto Morgan is apparently sometimes called the Venice of Gran Canaria. We thought if ever we did come back to Gran Canaria, Puerto Morgan is probably the place we choose to come. And it's back to Arcadia for a very sunny sail away from Las Palmas to Gran Canaria. Timan Fire National Park, the Fire Mountains, formed when a hundred volcanoes erupted in the 1730s. The last eruption was in the 1830s, but it's still very hot under the ground, and today we're treated to a series of demonstrations. The first one consists simply of shoveling up a little gravel from a couple of inches below the surface and dishing it out so that we can all feel just how hot it is. For the next one, a bundle of straw is dropped into a fissure in the ground and we wait for the inevitable to happen. For the most spectacular demonstration, first a little water is dropped into the hole in the ground just to cool the rock slightly. Thank you. 
Then the whole bucket goes in and stand back. A barbecue grill, fueled by the heat of the earth. Very economical. And it provides the food for the restaurant Il Diablo. You're not allowed to wander on your own through this Martian landscape, but entry to the National Park includes a coach tour around this desolate scenery. Leaving the National Park, our coach follows the lava flow down to the coast towards a natural formation called the Steam Cauldron. Our final stop in Lanzarote and the commercial opportunity is a vineyard. They grow the vines in a unique way here because of the high winds. Each vine is planted separately and surrounded by a little semicircle of lava rock. Apparently each vine plant grown this way produces a greater weight of grapes than one grown the conventional way. Ten to seven on a cold, wet, very misty Wednesday morning as we sail up the River Tagus past the Torre de Belém. The monument to the explorers built in the 1960s to celebrate the great Portuguese explorers of the past. Perhaps they're peering out to see if they can spot the other side of the Tagus. The 25th of April bridge, named after the date of the Portuguese Revolution, appearing out of the rain and mist. It used to be called the Salazar Bridge, but nobody mentions that name anymore. The statue of Christ the King now just appearing through the mist behind the bridge. It's a double-decker bridge with a railway track underneath the road deck. And you can see up through the open metalwork of the road deck. An hour or so later and the weather's lifted somewhat and we can now see the statue of Christ the King 
in its full glory. It was paid for by the mothers of Portugal in thanks for their menfolk not being actively involved in the Second World War. The P&O shuttle bus takes us to Praça Comercio, commonly known as Black Horse Square, laid out on the site of the former royal palace which was destroyed in the earthquake of 1755 along with most of the rest of Lisbon. The statue is José I, who was King of Portugal at the time of the 1755 earthquake. Walk through the arch onto Rua Augusta, the main street in the lower part of the town. This is a monument to the pavers who made these decorated mosaic pavements. Lisbon Cathedral, originally 12th century but most of what we see today is 14th century, built on the site of a mosque. There's a fine old cloister, the centre of which is being excavated by archaeologists and they've found buildings dating back to the Phoenicians, the Romans, the Visigoths and the Arabs. Originally opened in 1492, the Hostel de los Reos Católicos, in other words, Ferdinand and Isabella, was a hostel for the pilgrims to Santiago de Compostela. It's now a parador, in other words, a Spanish state-run hotel, and an ideal spot for an early morning cup of coffee after our coach ride from Vigo. It stands at one end of the great square of the Praza de Obradero, which also boasts the great façade of the Cathedral of Santiago de Compostela. The other two sides contain the Senate building of the University and the Palazzo de Raxoi, which is the seat of the city and regional governments. The façade of the cathedral, like the other buildings in the square, is 18th century, but it's built on an earlier Romanesque building. Inside, the cathedral is very richly decorated, from the 
donations of centuries of pilgrimage. This is where they swing the great censer on ceremonial occasions and they have much bigger ones than this that they use for very special occasions. Under the high altar passageways lead down to a small crypt and along here following a one-way system we arrive at the reputed remains of St. James the Apostle. The casket was built in Santiago at the beginning of the 20th century. And there's a large Gothic Renaissance cloister. Back inside you can visit the magnificent library, which apparently contains some priceless ancient books. and the sumptuously decorated chapter house. I think the canons of this cathedral live quite a pampered life. The chair in the corner was made especially for the visit of Pope John Paul II. And so we start our walk around Santiago de Compostela a perfectly preserved medieval town. Very busy with lots of bustling shops, some of which are quite tiny. There are other kinds of tourism now keeping the town busy apart from pilgrimage, but there are still plenty of pilgrims in come. Eventually, our stroll brings us back to yet another square, this time behind the massive cathedral, with other views of this imposing edifice.
You'd rather have a man. This is whatever called proof.